Yeah. Okay. So, hi, hello everyone, hello English readers, and welcome to a new live read-along of Lydia's Book Club. I'm Lydia Bureau and I'm an English teacher in France. I'm also the founder of Lydia's Book Club, and um, in which I host live readings of adaptations of classics or contemporary novels of English literature. And once a week, I meet the members of the book club in a live workshop via Zoom to discuss the chapters uh, of the book that we are currently reading um, and we discuss the chapters read over the week and in this book club I tend to prioritize books that are written by women and this month we are reading the graded reader adaptation of White Teeth by Zeta Smith over the next week we are um, I'm hosting I've been hosting uh, live reading sessions on inter Instagram and um, this uh, week is the last week so today and tomorrow are the last live reading sessions and uh, uh, you can watch those uh, live readings on replay on Ladies Book Club YouTube channel and on the Spotify podcast called Read in English. In addition to these nine live reading sessions, I will host three live workshops on YT as well. I've hosted two already so far. And um, in two weeks, I will host the last live workshop uh, on White Teeth. And it's going to be about the last chapters, um, the chapters that we are reading this week. Uh, so we're not doing the live workshop this Saturday, but next Saturday. And uh, to have access to this uh, workshop, then you have to become a member of the book club. Uh, so you can have access for free and um, make sure so make sure to to subscribe to the book club now you can find the link in the description of this video and all the dates as well um by clicking on the link and i also want to remind you that you can now purchase the three part live workshop of on jane Eyre that i hosted uh last month so Jane Eyre is a novel written by um, Charlotte Bronte and it's also a classic of English literature and the level is for um, A2+, plus, I think, uh, if I'm good. Right. Uh, so this is the novel that we uh, studied and the, novel, the level was A2+. Plus. And this novel, uh, White Teeth, is for level B2+. So you have to be, um, so it's for upper intermediate level. And A2 is intermediate level or upper upper beginner, let's say. Um, so once you purchase this uh, workshop that is available, even if you're not a member of the book club, you can just purchase the workshop and then uh, you just um, create your login, your password on the website, and then you have a private access to the workshop and all the videos. Um, and this way um, you can have access to it, uh, but you, you just pay one time, that's it. Um, so today we are reading chapter 13 If and if you would like to know more about White Teeth and um, her, its author, Zadie Smith, um, you, I invite you to listen to my podcast episode 21, an introduction to Zadie Smith and white teeth and it's available also on uh, youtube and spotify right so that being said now we can uh, start a quick recap so before i read i start reading i um do a quick recap on the chapters that we have read over the week um the last chapters Story. So yesterday, yes, yesterday we read chapter eleven and twelve. Um, so 
in chapter 11. If you're just uh, joining this live uh, and you don't know the novel or, um, yeah, you just... Uh, uh, landing now then I invite you to watch the video later on maybe um, to catch up on the chapters as well uh, so that you know more or less <laughs> hi Anna thank you for joining this live <laughs> um, so if you have any questions please um, um, ask me any questions in the chat um so we read so yesterday we read chapter 11 and 12 so in chapter 11 uh we learn that um marcus so marcus is remember uh mr chalfin he, he is the father of joshua and he, um, he's been writing letters to Majid. So Majid, remember, is Samad's son, and he has been sent back to uh, Bangladesh. Remember, Samad is very um, is is not happy about um, how English society is involving it's the it's the 80s 90s and um he doesn't want uh his children to grow up in the society however he can't send both of his uh, son so he's going to pick one and the one he's going to pick is majid uh, the well-behaved uh child um he is the eldest of a couple seconds because they are twins but he is the one that is uh has good grades or um he is very um serious in his um in his studies and he's not trouble you see so they thinking so samad take the decision to send his son um to oh sorry to bangladesh back to bangladesh and we learn in chapter 11 that marcus this father josh's father is writing to mujib that was quite unexpected and um we learn that uh, they exchange uh quite long letters and they talk a lot about science and um, um, sh shared interest like animals, especially Marcus that is very much interested in animal rights. Um, and uh, he's got this mouse project called Future Mouse. And um, he, um, yes, is very, uh, they're very much into Science. And he wants to um, encourage Majid uh, to go to university in Oxford, uh, Oxford University or Cambridge, the best universities in England, but also considered as the best universities in the world, one of the best universities in the world. In the world. So, um, yeah, that's... Um, that's Marcus um, um, plan or um, this is what he is, is um, expect from or uh, how he would like to help Majid to explore um, his uh, um, his intelligence and for him to have the opportunity to study and uh, be become, a lawyer actually to train to become a lawyer and defend animal rights uh, and Irie is remember Irie um, works well works she helps him in folding letters and um, she comes across one of his letter 
to Mujid. And there she learns that uh, he's talking about her enormous breasts again and um, how how Irie is not um, intelligent enough to become um, to become a scientist but instead she should she uh, she should uh, try medicine instead and dentistry more specifically um, this way she can she can fix her teeth so um that's very um that makes um Irie sad really to uh learn about to learn what she what he really thinks about her and um dentistry here again the topic the theme of uh, the teeth and everything around the topic of teeth and the studies uh, of uh, dentistry is again back on the table, back in um, the story. So uh, it's a recurrent topic here in this novel, again in this chapter. Um, then uh, we learn that Milat falls in love with this girl called Karina Kane, um, but is so influenced by the Kevin group. Remember this group of um, uh, very conservative um, um, Islamist uh, or very religious um, uh, men uh, towards Islam. Um, they have a very strong influence on uh, on uh, Milat. And when they see, they start seeing that Milat starts seeing, taking, he's uh, spending a lot of time with uh, Karina Kane. They um, start... Um, telling him that maybe he should get more involved in the Kevin group um, and uh, and he should, um, yes, get more responsibilities and come more often. Um, and, uh, well, this is what Milat is going to do and uh, he will... Um, He's going to break up with Karina. And uh, their relationship end. So here again, we see how religion or religious beliefs impacts relationships, whether it's one, one way or the other, um, especially um, Clara, for example, we've got the relationship between Clara and Ryan and they separate because Ryan get more into religion and Clara, well, into the Jehovah Witnesses and actually Clara wants to step away from it and take her distance. And here, um, Milat is already involved in this group this religious group, Kevin, uh, but not as much. And when, um, especially when Karina um, arrives in, in his life, arrives in his life, then he um, he's spending less time with this group of boys. And then um, these, these guys, when they see that his um, less present, then they're going to try to find ways to attract him again. So, and, and then he's going to um, follow their lead and um, take it and follow their advice. And he's going to break up with um, his girlfriend and um, similarly to Clara, who decided to uh, break up with Ryan because she didn't agree with the, 
and the Jehovah Witnesses believes anymore. So here again, uh, Smith wants to show the impact of religious beliefs and um, how much how how impactful those communities can be um, and can insert themselves or um, kind of um, place themselves between uh, in the middle of a couple and and be the cause of breaks up so um, breakups sorry breakups um so we see um here um, two examples of that whether if it's to take your distance go away from religion or whether it's actually to get more involved in it and um and and sacrifice your relationship in a way um and that was uh and then we uh we see Irie and uh, a couple of years there is a big jump in um in the years when um it's uh, a couple years when uh, later when Irie and Milat are at university and uh, um, Irie decides to Irie and Joshua I think yeah I remember yeah uh, decide to leave their home and uh, Irie actually uh, decides to go back to her uh, grandma to Orton's house Orton's Bowden remember uh, to her grandma so um, Orton's Bowden is uh, Irie's grandmother remember and uh, Irie decides to go go and live to her grandmother because uh, Irie is in a state in her life where she is um, she is in a quest of her identity she is searching for answers about her identity and uh, she's a little bit lost um, yeah she was 16 actually sorry she was 16 when she decides to uh, move to her grandmother and she is um she's kind of lost and she needs to understand where she comes from and um and she this and that's the reason why she decides to go back to the roots yeah we always when we want to find ourselves um when we're questioning our identity where we come from then um, we always uh, tend to ask our parents, or, well, if our parents don't necessarily have the answers, then we, we make some research or we go and talk to aunts or aunts and uncles or to our grandparents. And this is what Irie um, did. And, um, and Autumn's is quite surprised to to see uh, her granddaughter at the door and in chapter 12 um we learned that darkus um so uh, darkus is uh autens's autens's husband has died remember um he used to spend all his time hi Livia hello thank you for joining so remember Darkus uh, was um 
this father figure that wasn't really one. He spent all his time on the couch watching TV or uh, doing nothing and not being really an example, a good role model for, for, for Clara. And we learned that he passed away. And then... What, um, oh, yes, and we learned that, um, um, Ryan Tops is still uh, very much in touch with uh, with Orton's, he is um, still involved in the witness, um, Jehovah Witnesses, and Orton's introduces him introduces him to uh Irie and uh and then Ryan understands that it is Clara's daughter that she got with uh, Archie just uh just a few months in the end just a few months after they had they broke up. Yeah. And that's about it, I think. Yeah, more or less about um, those chapters. Um. And here again, we see that um, Irie is also very much involved into um, animals, um, animals' well-being, and she's uh, against the mis um, the the way we treat animals, and she's fighting for animal rights. And there is this group called Fate an animal rights uh, fighting group called FATE, which is the acronym for fighting animal torture and exploitation. So here again, the double meaning of uh, FATE here, um, in the sense that the fate of the animal and uh, which FATE is the, the destiny, means destiny in English. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, that's that's about uh, around there. Got letters, yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Livia. Okay, so let's get started with chapter 13. Majid returns. Okay, remember, Majid is the one I told you about, the one that the son that has been sent back to uh, Bangladesh. He seems like he is back to London or to England. Marcus waited nervously at Heathrow Airport Gate 32. Airport's gate 32. So Marcus is actually at the airport to welcome Majid, mm -hmm, not his father. Mm -hmm. um, at Heathrow Airport's gate 32, as a crowd of tired brown faces from BA flight 261 came towards him, turning at the last moment, the to meet aunts, drivers, children, and airline workers. You are Mr. Charlton? Meeting minds. Marcus lifted his head to look at the tall young man standing in front of me in front of him. It was Millet's face. But it was cleaner and somehow younger. The hair was soft and brushed forward in the in the English schoolboy way. His clothes were white and well made. Yes, of course, there were twins. Marcus could see that Majid had Milet's big nose and large feet, and this strangely disappointed him. But Marcus could see 
who Majid was really like. How had Majid recognized Marcus so easily from all the people waiting? Oh, how had Majid recognized Marcus so easily from all the people waiting? Majid and Marcus. Marcus and Majid. Yes, Majid, we finally meet, cried Marcus. I feel as if I know you already. Well, I do, but then again, I don't. But how did you know it was me? Majid gave him a huge smile. Well, dear Marcus, he replied, you were the only white man waiting at gate 32. Majid's return shook the Iqbal family. I don't recognize him, Arsena whispered to Clara. Arsena is his mother. This is not an Iqbal. He brushes his teeth six times a day and irons his underpants. I don't touch him because he's so clean in English. It's like sitting down to breakfast with Prince Charles. Milat immediately said that he did not want to meet his twin and Joyce and Irie were also unsure of him. They had loved the one brother so well, so many years, it was like another actor had come to play with him, uh, to play him with a similar haircut. And Samad was not happy at all. He would have hidden the boy away forever, looked him under the stairs or locked him under the stairs or sent him to Greenland. He did not want his relatives to see this English boy with his smart English suits and his intellectual novels. The only good thing was the change in Alsana. Yes, Samad, it is in the kitchen. That's where it is. Yes. Remember, um, Alsana had declared that, well, she had made up her mind that she would never, um, that she would never answer him yes or no. And it seems like she gave up at some point and um, that she just decided uh, to answer him now. The first time she did it, he nearly died from shock. No more maybe, Samad. No more possibly, Samad. Now it was yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. It was wonderful, but it was not enough. His sons had let him down and he felt great shame. If aunts and uncles phoned, he simply lied. Milat? He's in Birmingham, working at the mosque. Majid? Yes, he is marrying a good Bengali girl. Yes, a very good young man. So here again, whether um, Majid is the troublemaker, he's not doing well, he's not a good boy, or Milat being actually exemplary and um, being very studious and a good boy, then that's that then or intelligent and and uh, intellectual uh, young man that doesn't satisfy Samad again so it's a very complex um, Samad is a very complex character here because it doesn't seem to be satisfied whether his children are well educated and uh, want to have a good job or whether they're troublemakers and not uh, doing well. As long, it seems like a, as long as um, they're not following the path that he has decided for them, then is not going to be satisfied. Irie was not happy either. Her work for Marcus, which began nine months before, as light feeling had now hugely increased. Majid was helping Marcus now, and he was getting the media interest in Marcus's future mouse project. Okay. 
Suddenly, Irie was having to receive and make lots of calls. Marcus was paying her the same money as its secretary. But that was the problem. She was a secretary. But Majid, remember, but Majid was a trusted student. So you see the power dynamic here from Irie being put on a pedestal at first um, and helping Marcus in his work. And now how the situation flipped and it's Majid that now he is, is the, the, the one that is considered. And uh, remember she, um, Irie, when she read the letters when uh, Marcus was, uh, in which Marcus was saying that she would rather be uh, rather, she should rather study medicine and dentistry then she was fine with it she would become a doctor but here so she yeah kind of made up her mind that she would study medicine but this is far from studying medicine here she doesn't want to be a secretary but Machine was Majid sorry was a trusted student because of Milat Majid was now living with the Chalpins he went with Marcus on trips and watched him in the laboratory. He was the golden child, the chosen one. He was very clever and very nice and kind. He had helped Marcus with his arguments and taken him by the hand out into the light where people could see his work. Joyce, of course, was happy to have another beautiful young man to look after. She was very worried about Milad at the moment because he had missed his counsellor's appointment four days ago and had not been seen since. Look, she said to Irie in the kitchen one afternoon, the most important thing is that I get Milad and Majid to speak to each other. It is time. Irie looked unsure. Why is it time? She asked. Because they need each other, both both these boys have problems and it's not helped by Milad not wanting to see Majid. They have grown up with different religions in different countries. Can you imagine how they feel? But if they don't want to speak, then they don't want to do. They don't want to, replied Irie. And anyway, why don't you worry about your own family for a change? When's the, when's the last time you saw Josh? Wow, so we see... Now, Irie becomes quite uh, forward and a little bit rebellious. We see how Irie has been let down as, as a woman, not being considered by Marcus, and uh, as a girl, yeah, studying science or being worthy of more than uh, being a secretary and um, Joyce who from the start neglected well didn't really care much about her but was more um, was more worried about um, Milan's um, well-being and um, yeah, she evidently <laughs> uh, make Milan her favorite. Um, and here, Ari is just she's um kind of fighting back. Joyce gave her a strange look. Josh is in Glastonbury, right? Glastonbury finished two months ago. Josh, a uh, Joyce. He said that he was going to do a bit of traveling. And who's who's he um, and who's he with? asked Irie. You don't know anything about those people. Why don't you worry about that for a while? Anyway, Majid is fine. He's working with Marcus and is happy. Irie, please, said Joyce, sitting next to the phone because she was hoping that Milat would call. Josh just wants us to notice him, just like you want me to notice you at this moment. 
the truth is that Milad is going to get terrible to get into terrible trouble with these Kevin people. And I know it's worrying Majid. They're both damaged and need help, and I plan to give it to them. Joyce wanted to help them so much that she called on the Iqbal's house the following week. Five minutes. Um, five minutes, said Alsana, opening the door. Joyce entered, and the two of them looked at each other like fighters. Alsana made her some tea. There was no choice of tea in Iqbal's house. Mrs. Iqbal, Mrs. Iqbal, started Joyce, I know we haven't agreed in the past. I only have one rule, Mrs. Chalfin, said Alsana angrily. Do not involve yourself in other people's families. You think I'm involved myself? I'm involving myself? Asked Joyce. I think you have involved yourself. And I just want the twin to see each other. But I just want the, twin to, the twins to see each other. But you are the reason they are apart, replied Alsana, putting milky brown tea in front of Ju and Joyce. In front of Joyce. Um, milky brown tea is that because English people drink tea with a bit of milk. At this, Alsana began to shout. And why can't he talk to Milet? Because you and your husband have involved him in something that is so wrong in our religions. In our religion, we cannot even recognize him. He and his brother will never agree now. Those awful Kevin people, they think they are good Muslims following Allah, but they're just a bad gang and they are giving out leaflets about your husband and his mouse. I found, oh, sorry. I found them. I found them under his bed. Alsana took a leaflet from her pocket and threw it across the table at Joyce. Take it, lady, take it and show it to Majid. Show him that what you have done. Two boys driven to opposite ends of the world. You have made a war for my sons. Why don't you go back to your family and leave mine alone? You think life is easy at my house, replied Joyce. And then she began to cry a little. Joshua isn't speaking to Marcus. Did you know that? That mouse is hurting us too. That mouse is hurting, is hurting us too. I'm trying to help all of us. And the best way to start is to get Majid and Milad talking before things get any worse. If we could just find a quiet place for them both for them both to both to meet, I'm sure things will get better. Couldn't we ask Irie to help us? A quiet place? It was difficult. A quiet place? It was difficult to think of one. But finally, Joyce had an idea. There was a room in a college near the river Thames that she used on Friday afternoons and that she knew was always empty between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. Joyce gave the room key to Irie. But why me? cried Irie. I'm not involved. Exactly, dear, replied Joyce. And I'm too involved. You are perfect because you know them both. Irie took the key and walked out on the streets that, knew, that, she, that she knew so well. She passed the park where she and Milad had ridden bikes as children and where he had once kissed her in the middle of a storm. Then she jumped over the wall around Iqbal, Iqbal house like she had a million times before. Iqbal's house and rang the bell. Upstairs in this bedroom, Milat had spent the last 15 minutes on his prayer mat with a Kevin leaflet in his hand, trying to pray properly. He was frustrated and his body was sweating. Fingers must be closed and next to the ears, read the leaflet. The head must be between the hands at this moment, Irie entered and quickly exclaimed, 
to him about the room and the meeting with Mijid. She talked to him about Joyce's worries about making peace and then she came up and put the cold key in his hand without meaning to. She slightly touched his chest and suddenly their arms were around each other and they were falling on the floor and having sex. Then, as quickly as they had started, they had finished. Ooh, I was very fast. Irie put her clothes on quickly and began to cry because she could already see how much Milat regretted it. At the same time, Milat quickly got back on his prayer mat and put his hands next to his ears. This time, he prayed perfectly. Irie walked straight round to the chaffins. She was angry, but not with Milat. Milat did not love her, and she thought that he did not love her because he could not love her. He was damaged because Majid had been born first by two minutes. Milat was the lesser son because of Majid. Iri wanted Majid to be the second son for once. This time, by 25 minutes. <laughs> so here, basically she um, would have loved, um, she would have um, preferred not to have sex with him and uh, she regrets as well. Um, having relation, um, sexual relation with him. So here um, it's um, very nicely put to say that uh, she would have loved that he was actually Najid. Um, at this moment, because um, well, no, none of this would have happened. She walked straight into Majid's room put her arms around him, then made love to him angrily and without any conversation. Okay? So, right. So she, I don't know, she is, uh, it, that shows really that she's very, uh, she's not in her right mind. She's completely lost. Iris, um, she, it seems like she's attracted to them in a way, but yeah, she's just desperate and sad to be the one that uh, has to be in between, has to, to be the mediator and be in between them and be the one that's going to make them make peace. Um, and in, there is a form of attraction physical attraction as well but um, yeah it really shows that she is all over the place in her mind um, so well she sleeps with uh, Majid again Majid just like half an hour later and then made love to him angrily and without any conversation she pushed him round roughly and pulled his hair hard but when they had finished she knew that she had not won Majid had known immediately where she had been and why she was here and it just made him sad for a long time they lay together without speaking it seems to me Majid said finally, that you have tried to love a man as if he were an island for you. As if he were an island you found when lost in your boat. You wanted to mark the land with an X, but I think it is too late for all that. Then he kissed her on the head and, the, and she began to cry like a baby. Right. And that's the end of chapter 13. Uh, well, quite a lot of uh, action, 
we could say, <laughs> that of actions in a space of um very short time. Um yeah. And um this last sentence to me is very judgmental towards Clara, towards Ari, sorry. And the fact that um, it is written that she began to cry like a baby, as if she was a spoiled child. And um, yeah, it's um, it's very strong. There are very strong words uh, towards. Um, Irie's character and what she's been through the bullying the the fact that uh, she's been put down let down as well by Milat and um undervalued by Marcus um, yeah, it's um, yeah, and Joyce going to Arsenas for help. Um, yeah, it's a very toxic environment for this. Um, yeah, and the fact that uh, Mrs. Uh, Chalfin doesn't see the impact that she had on her son on Alsana's sons see the anger from Alsana is uh, mind-blowing um and to see finally to hear finally Alsana expressing her anger and uh, and her position and her opinion about all of what has been going on at the Chalfin's house with Milat and um, and with Najib, with the um, letters, uh, the correspondence between Najib and Marcus on the mouse project. Um, it seems that uh, the Chalfins don't realize by doing good, how yeah by doing good they actually done the opposite they actually um not made it worse but um they they are they have a part of responsibility in Majid and Milad's um, relationship or the fact that they don't speak to each other, the fact that they are so far apart. Um, but on the other hand, we could argue also that Samad has a strong um role in the fact that Majid and Milat grew up apart because one was on the other side of uh, the world and, and very far away they grew up apart and um, and that is not really acknowledged by Asana it's Samad who decided to send his son away and not Joyce so you have to put things into perspectives as well. And Alsana doesn't see or doesn't uh, mention that as well, doesn't want to see that or she's blaming um, Mrs. Joyce for everything. She's so... Um, desperate and uh, 
and sad that she doesn't see her sons and that they, her sons don't get on um, well. So, yeah, it's a very complex uh, um relationship and situation um in terms of uh who is responsible for that who is the um at the source of this um of all this um chaos in the way <laughs> so yeah um, I would love to hear what you think about this chapter and um, and, and exchange and what you think, what are your thoughts on um, these characters, their relationship and um, and on these uh, two chapters, uh, on these chapter um actually uh, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that um so I I'm going to leave you now to reflect on the novel and uh, I hope that you enjoyed this live reading um make sure that uh, you subscribe to the book club membership to be able to um express your um, ideas and share your thoughts on the novel uh, and be part of this of the final live workshop on white teeth uh, remember that you can also purchase the three-part live workshop on Jane Eyre on my website through the link that is in the description of this video and I wish you a beautiful end of the day and I'll see you tomorrow for the live reading of the chapters the last chapters of the novel and chapters 14 and 15s have a nice evening bye bye